Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. This is Zoe Vickstrom. Our guest this evening is Alex Lee, the Associated Student Body President of UC Davis. Alex, I want to thank you for being on our show. Yeah, thank you for inviting me onto the show. It's a pleasure. So let's start out with the big question. You represent all of the undergraduate students at UC Davis. How many students is that, and what do you think it means to be their representative? Yeah. So uh, again, my name is Alex, and I serve as the ASUCD student body president for UC Davis. And that's roughly about 29,000 undergrads and a growing number every year. So within the history of UC Davis, uh, I don't think undergrads have ever came close to that number. We're about close to the UCLA undergrads, and I've talked with their undergrad president about it. I was like, wow, we actually have the same constituency level now. But I think our um, population of undergrads has grown not just in numbers, but more diverse and from a more uh, metropolitan background. I myself personally am from the South Bay in California, so I'm from San Jose, and I know a lot of people are from even just my hometown come here, and it's a great percentage of people who are uh, more eth ethnically diverse, more, I guess, class and income based diverse, and it's just a great population to represent. And, you know, it's a lot of great minds to represent, and a lot of pressure sometimes, but it's all worth it in the end, I think. Yeah. So. I was a freshman 50 years ago when there were 8,000 undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a little perspective, most of the kids were white. Mm -hmm. We, when, uh, shortly after Chancellor Meyer became chancellor in 71, 70, um, we got a majority of women mm -hmm. at UCD. Yeah. So, uh, but the ethnic population has grown enormously. Um, Talk about a little about the ethnic diversity at UC. Yeah, just like you mentioned, John, I think in more so than ever in UC Davis history, we're more heterogeneous in our cultural background than ever. Uh, we're roughly about 40% Asian identifying students. We have 20% out of state students, and that's a mixture of international and you know, non Californian students. And right now, I think we're starting to approach how California's diversity is, where we're you know, a minority majority state, where there's such you know, diversity of cultures and backgrounds. I can speak more for the Asian Pacific Islander community, which I am proud to belong to. Uh, a lot of us come from, you know, the Bay Area in uh, California or Southern California, and a lot of us come from first or second generation. I know a couple of people that have had roots, you know, families that have been here since, I would say, the, the railroad days of California when we still had, you know, early waves of Chinese immigration. But a lot of more recent Chinese immigrants and Asian immigrants have come over, you know, through the Vietnam War era through the um, you know, change in China's history and everything. So a lot of people have come to Davis and we're much less homogeneous than we were. And that comes with its own rewards and struggles, you know, uh, with so many different cultures that are often, you know, and ideas that I think that are competing every now and then and trying to figure out how to work together in most harmonious kind of way. Uh, it definitely makes being student body president of everyone a uh, bit more difficult, but also more ch rewarding when we can bridge our communities together. And I think you see this a lot when administration kind of struggles to figure out in their old methods of, uh, you know, governing over a more white, more homogenous, even just white and more middle class. Now it's more, you know, working class, middle class, upper class, just from all stretches of society and all such different races as well. Like, how do you govern that all together? I think administration sometimes finds that struggle more so than I do. Um, you know, it's just different ways of thinking. But I think um, I try as much as I can to be future-oriented thinking and more macro picture and try to think, you know, there's this one issue that happens now, but I think it's a larger systematic issue and try to fix the systematic issue, too. I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure if I went on a tangent. But. The point is for you to yeah. talk, not for me to ask the question. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little about you personally. Yeah. So um, yeah. where did you grow up, San mm -hmm. Jose? Why did mm -hmm. you pick UC Davis? Yeah, so I was actually... I was a native born in California, too. I was born in Stanford Hospital. I lived in the San Jose area for my entire life, and I still go back home every now and then. I went to high school in Milpitas High School, where our percentage of Asian Americans was probably something similar in the tune of 50% as well. So I'm not a stranger to having a minority majority kind of population. It was actually quite the norm you know, to see other faces like mine and not to feel outcast in the society. So it's nice that I think in the UC system, it reflects that a little bit. Uh, coming to Davis, though, I actually took a tour of the UCs in the summer before my, before 
I guess my senior year summer, I don't even know anymore. I went to UC Santa Cruz, I went to UC Berkeley, and I went to UC Davis. Uh, and I went to San Francisco State University too, and I just saw the kind of schools that maybe I was gonna attend. Out of all the UCs I went to though, I loved going to UC Davis, the vibe felt nice, I liked how it looked, I liked the people, and immediately I already felt that kind of um, reputation that UC Davis had of being a very welcoming and friendly environment. Uh, not so much I could feel in UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, not to say that they're not good schools, it's just I didn't feel that way. And I knew a couple of people from my high school had come to Davis, so I thought it was more of a natural fit for me, and I haven't regretted it since, that choice. Uh, ever since I um, confirmed my attendant enrollment to come to Davis, I haven't regretted it since, so it's a really great choice. Uh, right now I'm studying political science and communications, I'm a double major. I'm trying to graduate uh, on time right now. Uh, but you know, juggling being a student leader and doing the class is a little difficult, but I think I'm gonna make it there in four years, and hopefully after that, I'll return eventually back to San Jose to contribute back to my community, because I think coming here as a student leader, figuring out the kind of issues that Davis faces, I sometimes think it's interesting, because it's like uh, Davis, the city and the community, and UC Davis sometimes, they all kind of have a, a um, a more miniature version of some of the issues that San Jose, where I'm a from. A microcosm. A microcosm, yes. It's like a little microcosm of the society that I face, yeah. San Jose is like the fourth largest, third mm -hmm. largest city one in them, California. Yeah. Yeah, it just fluctuates all the time. One or the other, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... didn't I, realize it was that ex big. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the Silicon Valley is, has driven a lot of, <laughs> of money, mm -hmm. and, and so there are a lot of people there. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. I mean, South Bay has become an enormous met metropolitan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of software engineers there, and you know, now that the, still tech boom, obviously, now there's a lot of business people, folks that live there, and uh, it's all sorts of interesting kind of walks of life out there, but my family moved there because my dad was a software engineer, too, so we went to Silicon Valley, obviously. Okay. <laughs> uh, just like a lot of kids at my, my high school and stuff, all their kids were engineers or you know, something techy kind of based, wasn't quite the startup culture it is now, or you know, mm -hmm. this, the, <coughs> the inward kind of business now, uh, but definitely a lot of people move there with kind of hopes of wealth and stuff like that, so it was really cool. But yeah, definitely where I'm from in East San Jose is an interesting mixture of, you know, wealth from the peripheral area and it's crime, but there's also a lot of diversity and there's a lot of tension in that area. But it's still good schools, still good people, it's just, I think, you know, poverty and systemic issues are still prevalent in the area and not to such a great degree up here, but I can see the kind of same, I think, roots of problems here that I want to bring back and say, you know, I kind of identified it here so I can bring it back, you know. Or they're universal. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're not a function of scale. They're in a mm -hmm. town of 50 where everybody knows everybody, most people know <coughs> who the rich person is yeah. and, and they know who you can ask for help. Mm -hmm. And they're not usually the same person. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in San Jose, definitely, you know where the rich persons are and the people you can ask for help are, but it's just you know, spread out in scale. Well, I, scale, I'm just right? saying yeah. that those are different standards. Yeah. They're yeah. different value systems. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to think the second is much more powerful. Mm. And so what I'm working on now, and then I want to know what you're working on, <laughs> is what I'm calling a metric more powerful than money. Mm. And, and that's what I'm interested in are those kind of values. So um, talk about the evolution of your education. What, what did you think about studying when you got to UCD and what are you thinking about now? Well, the evolution of my education. Um, what I think about studying, I still don't like it. I don't like studying, obviously, <laughs> I think as most students can relate to. Yeah. Uh, but I think, what is, I forgot who said this quote, but something about don't let school get in the way of your education. Who I've said, said that? that. You said that, obviously. <laughs> but someone else has said that. I've, I've heard of it course. before, like even since high school. Sure. Uh, but I've learned a lot through my roles in student leadership and obviously through my classes, too. I, I better how much I'm paying, right, in tuition. Uh, but I learned a lot. Um, I think definitely some of the lessons you see in high school where I grew up with expectations, like, oh, high, college is going to be so difficult. You have to study all the time. You have to do all this, you know, X, Y, Z. And I'm like, I come here, and it's like not exactly what people in high school made out, the teachers and advisors make it out to be, but it still is very rigorous. You know, you're learning a lot of, I think, very applicable things, and it's really up to the student to apply those things, you know. Um, whether you're in a STEM field and you're waiting to go to med school, and you're going to have to apply this eventually, right, how you know how cells interact or how you even know how organs interact. 
or how people interact. What I study is social science, right? Through political science and communication is how people relay their thoughts to each other and how do they get their um, goals done, right? And I try to figure out, well, this is what the academics and the theoreticians are saying. Now I go to state government or I go to local government and see, does it actually work out that way? And it's an interesting way of, I think, getting my education that way. I've definitely learned a lot of value of, especially in my field, of learning by doing. So you know, I think there's a lot of poli-sci students, political science students who learn about elections a lot, about government, but don't necessarily have the opportunity to be able to apply it and say, well, this lesson was a bit more BS than the other lessons. Maybe it does work. I think that's been really helpful. And there's always great theoretical models I love about ideology and voting patterns and everything. And then I apply it to real life, and I'm like, oh, this doesn't work at all. <laughs> so it's very fun to see those things What's happen. one of those? Do you have any, uh, an yeah. example? Yeah, so in an in introductory class about American politics, they teach you about this uh, spatial model, essentially, where they say the, all the people on the left ideology and all the people on the right ideology, if a proposal comes by, uh, all the right people and the left people vote for whatever's closest to them, and they'll kind of compromise. And in real life politics, even I think in national government, if you look at it, mm -hmm. they'll sometimes, even if it's close to them, and it's not quite what they want, they'll just say no to it anyways. They won't well, accept yeah, it. They won't compromise. There's not as much compromise. Yes. A lot of, I think a lot of the lessons are built on this idea of compromise and like self, or you know, this, this rational self-actor, which mm -hmm. you see in economics a lot and even in political theory. And it's not quite that all the time. It's not quite straightforward. It's this one rational decision. It's a lot of emotions mixed into it, a lot right. of like personal connections. And I think I like, that's what I like about communications. It's all about personal connections and how do you talk to different people in different ways and everything. So consider studying that. That's oh, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm always interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to promote the book I was talking about 10 minutes before yes. the show started. I'm, I'm rereading The Social Animal by mm -hmm. um, David Brooks, the mm -hmm. New York Times columnist. Mm -hmm. and, and it talks about humans as not being rational but being social. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that the kind of thing you talked about about proximity is, mm -hmm. has enormous influence on people. My own lesson in 50 years is 1%, 5%, 25%, 50%. 1% pay attention to everything. 5% mm -hmm. are the soccer moms, the people that hold the country, the world together mm -hmm. and have for 10,000 years. They're up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They're on the phone until 10 o'clock at night. They're the people that take care of the children of the world. And in the middle of that, they talk politics. And if you can get them to talk about you, then that's a big victory. Mm -hmm. The 25% turn to the soccer moms and say, there's an election coming. Who are you voting for? Mm -hmm. And the soccer moms go, well, I'm voting for blah, blah, blah. So the key to the election, and then 50% actually vote, and the other 50% don't care at all. Yep. So that's reality. Mm -hmm. But it's the 5% that holds society together. Mm -hmm. So that's... so. How have you it, yeah. evolved in terms of what you're studying? So I want, I want you to get to where we talk about cities. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, it was still the, I think it's that practice of applying knowledge and the knowledge I'm taught and then applying it to real life situations. Something that we've talked about a lot off air, obviously, is about cities and urban planning. And that's something I found as a recent interest to me. So it's kind of made me... Uh, looking back at it, regret, oh, why didn't I do landscape architecture or do community and regional development or, you know, the uh, urban planning type field? I was just thinking that's like a lot of where my passion is because I think within this basic foundation of infrastructure, of where people live, how people get to where they need to go to work or shop, um, you know, every type of mode of just planning how people live and how interact in an urban environment really shapes all the outcomes we see, you know with racial tension, with poverty, with homelessness, all these things basically are affected from these, this, uh, this, the root of the problem is basically things are poorly built, poorly planned. I live in a city that has too many freeways that are cut through all these, all these neighborhoods because someone in San Jose thought, you know, LA's so great, we're gonna be like them, and then that was, bad. <laughs> uh, that was a bad idea. But thankfully we've gotten as bad as them in certain aspects, like with traffic and with the way things are just sprawled out all over the place. Uh, but we do see some of those same problems come up. And if we were built smarter, I think like Sacramento, and where I've got to actually do some internships there with the capital, like Sacramento is built in a really nice grid pattern, I think, where it's very convenient to get to everywhere. But it's also, I think, if I didn't do political science, though, I wouldn't have this mind of like juggling and jumping from one topic to the other. 
So even with urban planning, I'm thinking about, oh, how will this affect you know, um, economics in the local region, right? How does this affect commerce? How does it affect how diversity issues are and how it will affect education, right? And how will it affect in the end, like, will people even want to live here and want to participate, right, in this community, right? So I think through political science, I've been exposed to a lot of things, what I'm studying. Um, I don't know if it's the same thing if I just went in and I was like, I'm going to be an architect, like my family. And uh, I don't know if I would be very interested in applying things for other people rather than just, you know, I like this building, I'm going to build it this way, you know. Um, I don't know if that, that gets to it. Uh, I'm sort of getting to it, I guess. So, <laughs> I'm, so I just want to yeah. jump out from what you just said about an alternative to an architect. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm a health planner. I'm more interested in where people are born and where they die and mm. how they live and what they do with their time. Mm -hmm. So for me, the built community is something that's very diverse yeah. and, and frequently doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so that then becomes the social problems. Mm -hmm. Now, other people, so I just found out that Don Saylor's daughter is getting her PhD on, oh, wow. in public policy mm -hmm. at uh, North Car University of North Carolina after almost getting her PhD on, on how the air oh, works. Oh, right. So she went from being a biologist to being a social policy analyst and decided that's where her passion is. Yeah. Now, since that's where her parents' passion is, that's no big surprise. <laughs> but the, the point I want to make is that there are many ways that you can affect yeah. how the social policy translates into reality. And then mm -hmm. I just want to give you a very perverse example. Sometime around 1980, somebody mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. looked at the map of Davis. And at that point, the post office was where the Davis Enterprise is yeah. now. It was on G Street, and it was the center of town. Mm -hmm. But we were a town. We were not a city. Mm -hmm. And at that point, everybody who was anybody went to the post office every day. It was the place to meet. It, it was the center of the city. It yeah. was what farmer's market has become. Yeah. It was the place where people yeah. crossed. I mean, everybody went to get their mail at 10 o'clock in the morning at the same time and, or 2 o'clock. I mean, you saw the, your community by mm -hmm. choice. Well, somebody in Washington, D.C. in 1980 said, Davis is going to grow. Let's move the post office to this land in eastern Davis. Oh, yeah. And when they did that, they destroyed the downtown oh. in terms of being the center of the city. Wow. Now, all the banks are still required by law, city law, to be downtown. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying these are the gutsy kind right, of things right, that right. I want to get into with yeah. you about what, what urban challenges actually mm -hmm. translate into. Yeah. Yeah. So. For the rest of the show, we want to talk about two things. The first thing we want to talk about is the next chancellor. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking to Ralph Hexter next week. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to talk about is the future of Davis and how the student body can be involved in that discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what the student involvement should be. Mm -hmm. So I'll save my student comments for, for that. For them. I'll just say one thing now. My split mind works. There are three kinds of people in Davis. Mm -hmm. There are the undergraduates that know you're going to be here, if you're lucky, four or five years and graduate. Mm -hmm. And some of those people actually do that. Some move on. Some don't Fingers make crossed. it. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the point is you think, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to fill yeah. my parents' dream. I'm going to fulfill my dream. I'm going to become an adult. I'm going to go out in the real world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to be a success. Mm -hmm. OK, those kind of people do not care about very much about Davis. Mm -hmm. By definition, I was one of those people, OK? Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew the name of the mayor, Vigfus Asmundson. I thought anybody with a name that weird, it's got to be a weird <laughs> town. That was all. I, and I was a local government person. Mm -hmm. and, but I knew how many counties there were. I knew a lot yeah. about the state of California. The second group of people are grad students or people that are here for what they know is a short time. Mm -hmm. These people are adults. They're 25 to 50. They may have a two-year grant. But you know, they were, they were in Madison, Wisconsin. Then they were in Austin, Texas. Then they were in Reno, Nevada. Then they were in San Francisco. And now they're in Davis. Mm -hmm. 
two months from now, they may get an offer to go to Eugene, and they're up and gone again. OK, those kind of people don't care about tables. The third group of people are people that think they want to live here for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Now, that's about a third of the population. And the first group is 25 to 40 percent of the population of the city of Davis, and they're the student body. Right. Yeah. And they're an integral part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, that's why the students need to be involved in the conversation mm -hmm. about the future of the city. Mm -hmm. So that was my, my split. So mm -hmm. you got elected student body president in February mm -hmm. on or about the end of February. Roughly, yes. The all hell broke loose mm -hmm. for Chancellor Kate. Mm -hmm. So you have only experienced the chancellor during the turmoil mm -hmm. And then the transition to Ralph Hexter. Yeah. So actually, so I was elected. Uh, the election was in February, mid-February, and that stuff had been stirring, but it wasn't quite as bad as we've seen it to be. Uh, I took office. I was, you know, took my oath of office and everything on March 10th, and it was March 11th when the sit-ins began. So that was basically the first thing I had on my plate was this whole chancellor thing, and I don't think any president in recent memory, at least, has had something quite like this. It was definitely interesting to balance where my predecessor took a lot of effort to rebuild relationships with administration. It was, but she was a yes. very unique person. Yes, she definitely was. But I think it was you know, a necessary thing to do because we had become too isolated from the rest of campus. And that's something I've kind of uh, tried to carry forward is with the faculty and with the administration to build real relationships with it because it's, you can't get anything done and you can't oppose them if you can't communicate with each other because uh, then you're just shouting each other from different islands. It doesn't work that way very well, right? If you really want to make change, you have to be able to stare the other person in the eye and say, look, you're doing something wrong. You need to fix it right now, instead of me going in this corner and say, I think they're doing it wrong. But um, so our predecessor took a lot of time to rebuild relationships with uh, administration. So I was very cognizant of that when I was going in and had to balance between, you know, there's a lot of student frustration over what uh, Chancellor, former Chancellor Kotehi had been doing. And to try to balance this, like, well, in my role, should I, which one should I throw into, sort of thing. Uh, and by was it by late April? She had been put on suspension. April 27th. And, yeah, April 27th, that's the day. And the day after that, when Ralph Hexter became interim chan acting, acting chancellor, acting chancellor, I'm sorry, he actually found time to meet with me. I, the night that happened, I emailed him and I said, well, looks like you're going to be in quite the spot and it's a good luck to that. And he actually found time to meet with me the first day. And I think that showed a lot about him that he was willing to finally take students. Hopefully, after all that happened, students more seriously than his predecessor had. And I've found that to be definitely my experience with uh, interim Chancellor Hexter is that it's kind of night and day in a lot of respects. When I was growing up in Davis, you know, from a freshman to basically where I am now, I knew the chancellor, like most people knew of the chancellor and they knew of the office, but it always felt in this kind of uh, very remote sense. Kadehi always traveled with kind of an entourage, she was very hard to reach. But with me, at least for me personally, with Hexter and I think some other student leaders have been pretty accessible. And I think obviously it has to do with some of the pressures from the movement to fire Kadehi, obviously. But I think he, in general, is more willing to engage. I've actually worked with him in the past when I was a senator and he was provost, so we had known each other in the past. So I think that helped when we had a little bit of working relationship before. Uh, but definitely he's been more willing to engage, especially with me. I think in my experience, when I thought it was a norm, I think this is what chancellors are supposed to be. They're kind of like aloof a little bit. They kind of know what's happening. But, uh, but Ralph Hexter has been pretty knowledgeable about most things, to my surprise, most of the time. So one big thing that's been on my docket, especially with the city community and, and with the campus, is housing for students. Because as our population grows so unnaturally and exponentially, natural growth of a city, even if Davis is growing naturally, could not keep up you know, with that kind of pace, right? So I'm very concerned about the future of students that are freshmen now and the freshmen four years after them, or even my brother when hopefully he comes to Davis, who's eight years younger than me. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to find housing that's easy to find and affordable, right? I don't want people paying the same kind of rates they are in Norman Lake at Santa Barbara or LA or uh, Berkeley. I say Berkeley already, or, you know. But I don't want us to become like them, where I feel like we have the opportunity to address those problems early on before we hit the crisis button and say, we got to do something now. Before, And I'm trying to say, like, we, we could have done it right now. 
you know, we can stop the, the sinking ship now. And a lot of that, I think, I think I've been bringing up to Chancellor consistently. Every time I meet with him, I'm saying, like, this is the number one issue in the long term and the short term. You need to, like, address it now. He's willing to engage with it. He definitely has taken it pretty seriously and has been thinking about it a lot. And we've constantly had conversations about it. I think that's definitely a step up from Chancellor, uh, former Chancellor Katehi, where when I would say something, I feel like I was talking to a wall sometimes. I would just say an idea, and the, the, just the engagement is different. You know when you talk to someone, and they're just kind of like, you know, they're polite listening, or versus they really engage with what you're saying, you know? And it's like, it just felt different a lot. And I was saying, and I just felt, wow, you know, chancellors can be different. And I started talking to the other presidents in the system, like, you know, how is your, your chancellor like? And, you know, they have funny stories about their chancellor and stuff, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty interesting. I didn't even know it could be like this. Because when I was a senator or when I was a freshman or second year, I thought, you know, only special people could ever talk to the chancellor. But now I think, especially coming in with a new chancellor, it, you can't have someone who has this kind of like uh, regalness to them, you know, almost. Like when you, you go up to the chancellor, you get a bow twice or something. Uh, you can't have that, I think. And hearing stories about Chancellor Vanderhoof back in the day, just how embedded in the community he was, I think we need that in a new, in a new chancellor. And something I've been really pressing with uh, UCOP, UC, UC Office of the President who oversees all UC systems, and with the faculty through the Academic Senate, students even, and the administration, is we need to think about, and I'm sorry this might be a little uh, ingrained in the UC politics, but uh, we, we need to think about in the UC there's this idea of shared governance. So it's sharing between, formally, it's between the faculty and administration. So they make decisions together, right? They share the governance of the system, right? But formally, students, undergrads and, uh, and graduate students aren't in this system. And I've tried to iterate to them multiple times, saying, you know, we need to be the third branch, right, basically. We need to balance each other. Because if the faculty aren't getting in with admin, the admin aren't getting in with faculty, it's always this dead-end lock, right? If they never agree, they just knock heads all the time. And I'm saying, well, there's this third group that is intrinsically, intrinsically, um, <laughs> you okay, John? Yeah, yeah. No, you're talking about the reason why yeah. the institution exists. Yeah, basically. Between, I, and I said this academics, the reason, the integral, essential uh, reason the university exists is between the students and the, and the faculty, right? The people mentor relationship. And if you're discounting the people part of it, what is, what's the point? Because you know? yeah. we are just as interested in the way this university is ran, just as much as faculty, just as admin are, right? just that the administration are paid to constantly run it. The faculty share in it because they have an interest in it too. But we are the ones paying the tuition, paying the fees, and we're the ones coming here willingly, right, and en masse. So we have a big stake in it. And as you're saying, there are tons of people that come here just for the degree, right? But it's my, I think, responsibility and other student leaders to say, like, this experience, even if you choose willingly not to engage in shared governance in your city or in your university, it's my responsibility, no matter what, to say you get the best experience you can, right? It's to say, like, when the freshman here shouldn't have to suffer this issue that I had, and I wanted to fix it. It's the same thing where if, you know, your kids or your kids and their kids come, it should be better than it was before. I don't want it to be um, worse off, right? That's the whole point of trying to be in leadership and government. You don't want, I don't want it so that when my brother comes here, he will have everything 10 times worse. He doesn't, he'll have, you know, a 500 person lecture hall for, in the most basic class where he can't ask a question because he doesn't feel comfortable raising his hand amongst 500 people. I don't want him not to be able to graduate in five years because um, tutoring wasn't available or because he couldn't even get the classes he wanted. And I don't want him to have to commute from, say, Woodland or West Sacramento because there was no housing in Davis at all. That's the things I want to try to fix. I would try to move the dial on. I know realistically in, in my term I can't fix everything, but it would be nice to say, you know, I've met some really great community people. I've met some really great administrators and faculty who are on board with this. I can carry it, this ideology with them. You know, In the end, it's ideas that drive the world, right? If these people who are here can carry on that idea, carry the torch with it, then they'll make decisions based on that ideology, right? And so hopefully, so my, my goal is just to keep shouting it very much at them and say until they believe in it. You know, That's kind of my approach so far. So I guess the first thing I want to say is mm -hmm. that Chancellor Vanderhoff was here a long time. He yeah. came in 85, mm -hmm. and um, he was named interim in 93. And then um, the, the one point is the year before 93, we did the phase three budget cuts. Mm -hmm. And UCD 
unlike every other UC campus, UCD went all the way down to the graduate student level and said, we're going to cut 10% of the budget. Where should we cut? At UCLA, they went to the department head level. At Berkeley, they went. They didn't go down to the faculty, let alone the grad students. So as executive vice chancellor, Vanderhoff once a month went to the regions. Mm -hmm. And then on Friday, he went to the main theater or Freeborn Hall, yeah. and the room was full. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is what happened at the regents meeting yesterday. And it was better than reading the San Francisco Chronicle yeah. or the Chronicle of Higher Education. You could find out what the regents were really doing when major budget cuts were happening throughout the UC system. Mm -hmm. And so during that year, Chancellor Van, at that point, Provost Vanderhoff mm -hmm. was meeting regularly with the whole public and got mm -hmm. vetted. So when the transition was made to Huller, there was no question about who was leading the campus. <laughs> at that point, mm -hmm. Vanderhoff was leading the campus. Mm -hmm. The question now is to what extent is Hexter tainted by the fact that he's been associated with Katehi? Mm. He came here six months before the um, pepper spray. Yeah. Yeah. And the pepper spray really defined her administration. But I just want to make the point to say when I had my first meeting with Ralph Hexter, which was in May before the pepper spray, the students had marched to the chancellor's office, and she was so upset about that that the fifth floor was in lockdown. Mm -hmm. There was no way you could get into the fifth floor unless you had an appointment. Mm -hmm. And that was six months before the pepper spray. Mm -hmm. So she was draconian in her administrative mm -hmm. style. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a contrast between her and Vanderhoff. Yeah. Vanderhoff was very friendly the last four years after he got the money from Mondavi. Yeah. So then the, the Larry Vanderhoff we remember is that guy mm -hmm. who was somebody that you could sit and he'd listen to what you had to say. Mm -hmm. Chancellor Katea was very impatient. She was very ambitious. She was very driven. Mm -hmm. So um, we may have benefited from that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm certain that there are problems. Mm -hmm. If Ralph Hexer is taken off the list, what are your criteria for who the mm -hmm. what the chancellor yeah. should be like? Yeah, and this is definitely on the minds of many students, and I'm working with the student committee members on the selection committee uh, of not only Davis but Berkeley as well because their president is actually on the committee and I talk with him every now and then about this. Um, someone definitely who I think understands the student experience, who can really relate to it, not just someone who can say, you know, I'll listen to students because it's something very different about understanding the experience and of course, you know, empathizing with experience to, in the way you govern, you know, in the way you make decisions, in the way you process decisions and process information. But I think a very important thing is they have to do this knowing that modern education, the mo modern higher education is like what it is now, where the state isn't contributing the kinds of funds it has in the past, where people aren't paying the easy tuition that a lot of generations in the past, set, uh, I think, benefited from, where it was, you know, they, they you know, all these stories about saying like fifty dollars a fifty dollars a quarter or whatever. I paid that much for, for um, for tuition, or um, you know, where the cost of living is much higher. The pressure to get your degree and the pressure of society, where you know, kids like me, or students like me, I should say, I'm not kidding. Where uh, students like me have to uh, basically go to college because that's the social expectation now. You know, and even the marketplace expectation, right? You can't just go out in high school degree and get a job that way. You have to do all these BS, BAs, grad school even before you can have something competitive and survive in this economy, you know? In this really, you know, very, very competitive economy and the global economy too. Um, so there's all those pressures about from the student perspective, but it's like, can you really support us here when we have all those pressures, finances, social expectations, and education is still harder too than it ever was too. And the, a chancellor really has to think about that, right, as one very important piece of your constituency. And I understand that a chancellor also has to balance, you know, the faculty, the staff, everyone else as well. And that's, I think, very valid, but they have to put the student experience as top priority, I think. Because in the end, if no students are coming and everyone's having a terrible time, what is the point of this university, right? The faculty are just here to do research, I guess, now, or here to just teach the people who are just miserable and not getting anything out of it. And it's not really education anymore, right? It's just this the cyclical degree mill, which is not... I don't think Industrial anyone's. education. Yeah. You don't want that. Factories. No, you don't want that. We're just mass-producing mm -hmm. diplomas. 
And that's definitely something I want to avoid, right? And we're kind of starting to see that a little bit, right? Where people have to do things because they have to, right? And there are those people definitely who come here a couple years and say, I need this class, I need this degree so I can go to med school or I can go to law school, right? And that's their goal. And that's what's very valid. It's very valid though, right? But while they're here, is their life being enriched by it in any sense? Or is this just, okay, we're doing the bare minimum for students so we can skirt by, right? But it's like at the same time with budget cuts and with these new pressures, they have to understand how to prioritize as well, right? So you can't be putting on, I think there are unnecessary expenditures or thinking about higher education in an older sense saying, well, it used to be like this back in the day, so why can't we just keep doing this, right? It's not that anymore. You have to be adaptive, you have to be innovative, and you have to know that students are more diverse, more metropolitan, and um, face enormously different pressures than they ever have in the past. And it's only going to get, I think, worse as it goes. And they have to be good leaders in that. Certainly more complex. Yes, yeah, certainly more complex. More I complicated. So. Yeah. More, more, I mean, the, the whole point of learning is to discover how to work your way through things. Yeah. So you know, one of the great dilemmas that your generation had, that my generation invented, of which there were many, <laughs> Many problems we invented. One of them is hacking. So what a hack is, is you create a barrier within a computer program, right. and then you figure out a way to get through the hack. Mm -hmm. And that's what a hacker is. So right. the, the, that's what learning is, is you come to a challenge, you come to something you can't understand, and you talk to other people, you experiment, you, that's what learning is, mm -hmm. is that I, hackers, I, so you know, my joke is, if you wanna know how to get a child protected device to work, give it to a child. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They'll figure it, because they're impatient, they're curious, mm -hmm. that's, that's just what our minds are. Yeah. I mean, the, the creative outlet, by the yeah. time you graduate, you should know what your major should have been. <laughs> yeah, it's the beginning of that, your education, yeah. not the end of your yeah. You know, it's the, it's the dream that your parents had. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is the accomplishment. Mm -hmm. For 200 years, it meant you're an adult. Mm -hmm. It meant you can be addressed as mister, mm -hmm. and you can teach in a school. Mm -hmm. That's what a bachelor's degree, I'm literally a bachelor's degree <laughs> means. They don't call it a bachelorette degree, thank goodness. <laughs> Okay, back to reality. Other things about the chancellor. How much is biology, do you think, important? How, how much is, I'm sorry? Uh, so, my bio, 60% oh. of the faculty, 60% of the research, and 60% of the undergraduates at UC Davis are biological science majors. Mm. How important is it that the chancellor be a biologist? I don't necessarily think they have to come from a certain field to be a good chancellor. I just think they have to be good with people skills, I think. I think we've seen in the past where very um, staunch academics come into governing positions, like I think with former President Yudof, which was kind of infamously not such a great mix of leadership governing and then his style. I don't think they necessarily have to have it, but a background in, bio in biological sciences, I think, or STEM major even, could be beneficial. I say could be because we previously had someone who was in STEM, right, background in faculty and research and everything. I don't think it necessarily translated to a better understanding of students and their experience and making their experience better. I don't think it necessarily did. Uh, but if someone could use the own leverage of someone, I think like even interim provost right now, uh, right. Ken Burtis is right. what used to be dean of biology. I His think perfect he, yeah. example is somebody for a number two. Yeah, I think I'm he glad has you it, yeah. brought him yes. up. I was going to. I actually got to meet him, I think, before I became president. We had a great conversation because he was planning a 2020 initiative back right. then when it right. wasn't completely thrown a wrench with the right. new enrollment plan. Uh, and he was just telling me about how the plans are. And then we, and he said, he had a lot of issues or a lot of um, concern about international students and their, their well-being because if they're being grown this way and they're still getting slapped with triple tuition, how are they going to get the resources they need? And then we also brought up uh, traffic concerns and like transportation concerns and saying how, you know, uh, the transportation authority will say there are X amount of parking spots on campus, but they don't really factor in that 
you know, half of them aren't really used and there's this parking situation because a lot of students are now preferring to drive because of their backgrounds and everything. And, and he thought about that more and he actually had follow-up conversations and we had, a, so I'm very pleasantly surprised out of that conversation that I've, people have those. Kind of I've had two really them. wonderful conversations yeah. with Ken Burtis, the yeah. acting provost. Yeah. And, and what Ken, Ken said was it would, what he was doing before was he was supporting Ralph Hexter when Ralph was the provost mm -hmm. as his advisor on mm -hmm. biological science yeah. issues. So to me, Ken is doing a great job of being the number two. Mm. Um, I think that the skills that Ralph Hexter brings are mostly that because he's a comparative literature junkie, <laughs> yeah. he actually cares about the language that individual scientists use. And so maybe a biologist and a chemist or a biologist and a physicist might sit down and not be willing to hear each other. Yeah. And he can hear them both enough that he can get to them yeah. communicating. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. actually his strongest skill as an administrator. Yeah. I think so. But he is very warm and open and, mm -hmm. and approachable in ways that yes. Chancellor Katehi was the ice queen. So, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the other comment I want to make though is, on the outside chance somebody doesn't know what STEM means. Oh, it's yes. science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I made the point that she will would claim biology students as being STEM students when yeah. she's talking about the numbers. Right. But she doesn't include biology when she means STEM. That she was an electrical mm. engineer. Right, she wasn't right, even a right. civil. If she'd yeah. been a mechanical engineer, she would have had to deal with natural things a lot more. Mm -hmm. If she'd been a civil engineer, she would have had to deal with the real world. Mm -hmm. But she was an electrical engineer specializing in antennas. Mm -hmm. um, Ralph specializes, the last I'd heard, on Virgil, yes. the, mm -hmm. the Latin scholar. Yeah. So uh, he brings a different perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I would hope that, that if we get a new person that's mm. somebody that has a lot of previous experience with biological science mm. stuff. Um, I, I did have a hand in getting the vice chancellor for research uh, reappointed when it was Barry Klein, mm. who was a physicist, and he didn't understand biology, and I said, I think that the vice chancellor for research at the Ag campus of the University of California should know what a mitochondria is. <laughs> and so I was going around to the vice chancellors and the dean saying, do you know what a mitochondria is? And it was shocking how many of them did not. And the, the secret is they create oxygen. They do all the work inside your cell. So uh, this, um, the surgeon in the vet department said, it's the lungs of the cell, it's what does all the work. So it converts That's stuff so that you have energy. Yes. It's really important. We need to know biology. The people in the administration are making decisions. <laughs> if, they're not, if they're not conversant in the science, right. they're not gonna make good decisions. Mm -hmm. So um, what's your view of the future of the campus? Future of the campus, I have focused a lot um, as president under the circumstances of increased enrollment where we have, ten, we're looking at, you know, thousands of new students within just the next couple of years. Uh, I mean, I always knew population growth was going to be a thing. It's just that I think with this impetus of a lot of new students coming at once, it was more pressure to say, talk to admin and faculty, we need to make changes now, not like keep waiting. So. Uh, I've, th I've talked a lot about to students and to faculty and to admin about how we need to improve our academics, the academic experience for students. So like I mentioned about wait lists, uh, I've got you know, friends who, who still on the wait list of classes took the midterm for it just because they're like, well, I might, I might be in it or not. So, and you know, these are 100 people lectures or several hundred people lectures that people still are crammed into. And, I, and it's still very ridiculous where the students and friends I have who take classes in the Madavi Center, who take classes in the, the, the area activities and recreation center, which is like the, the gym essentially, mm -hmm. right? Where we have to do these, these stopgap measures. And really I don't want this to keep happening, right? And to say, look, you need to make plans to build student housing and student infrastructure with transport, with classrooms and student support, like now, because it will not 
even if they, we all committed to doing this uh, tonight, it would take another three years, four, three, four years before. At least, that. yeah. It would take them that long to start yeah. digging. <laughs> exactly. It would take them forever to do it again, right? Now they're building a new lecture hall just off of uh, California, and that's going to be finished out of it, you know, the next year or two. And that's going to be a big, big classroom seater, but still, it's time. And it's time that students don't have. Like with current renovations, some renovations that have been going on for two years almost, there's generations of students who didn't know that I'm still going, going to school with that didn't know what it was like before. And I don't want a whole four year generation to go, well, I know there's construction happening there, but like I don't ever know what it was, right? A lot of students don't even know what Freeborn used to be. I was one of the last class of students I got to see it functional, and then they just closed it. I don't want students to not be able to live in Davis anymore, where they can't find it anymore, because the vacancy rate uh, is so low. Even It's lower than compared to Sacramento region, and that's a whole city area. And that's pretty ridiculous to me. And the average rent is higher. It's by, higher by far than even Sacramento. So when I'm thinking about my future career, I'm like, well, why stay in Davis? I should might as well save money and live where I work, right? And it's a really nice place to live, obviously. And a lot of people, I think, want to live in the city, want to have their own house or apartment. They don't want to live in a university kind of apartment type thing or a city dorm, I mean, I'm sorry, university dorm thing, even if they were available right now. But the problem is they aren't even available, so we don't even have the options. And what I want to expand, is, especially in housing, is the options for students, whether they want to be able to live in, <coughs> in Davis, the city, or on UC Davis, the, the campus. I want them to have the option to shop around. You know, It shouldn't be where I have to go live in this place or I have to go live in this place. They should be able to com competitively shop, right? just as I think any normal person should be able to when they decide where to live. But I think the future Davis really is dependent a lot on this chancellor. We have a lot of vacancies in the higher leadership with our CFO being gone, all these deans and people that are all gone, and they're all vacant right now. There's a lot of interim XYZ positions right now. Um, so whoever comes in has a lot of sway in saying, you know, this is the direction we're going in. We've got to do it full throttle right now. And I think whoever does it has to have a sense of urgency, especially in the student experience, of saying, you know, this is a problem. We cannot let students continue to have this kind of experience. I read in a report where I think uh, compared to other UCs, we have the lowest four-year graduation rate. And that's a shame. Wow. Yeah, one of the lowest, I think it's something like about one in two graduate within that I, time. I think I saw 55%. Yeah, something like that, about half. Because a lot of students that I know are taking either, after your, your, your normal four years, you take either you know, another quarter or another year. So fifth years are pretty common now. And that's why even colloquially people say, in the, for the next four or five years at Davis, you know, it, it's seeped into the culture yeah, already, yeah. right? Which is, a, which is a shame when you come to, come to Davis, UC Davis as a student and you're like, I'm the class of, well, for me, I'm the class of 2017, but I'm leaving in 2018, yay, you know. Or 2017, if you graduate in the fall, so it's still 2017. But, you know, the idea was that the promise you came in was the idea you would graduate in the summer, unless you really wanted to stay, right? You shouldn't, students ha shouldn't have to, say an extra year because they had to. Because their class wasn't offered, they couldn't get into the class, they didn't have the support services to be able to pass that class they needed. And in my case, some of my classes are scheduled on top of each other, so I couldn't, I have to wait, you know. So I have to be delayed. I couldn't graduate um, earlier than I wanted to. Or, you know, all these types of instances that happen, especially when there's really mapped out uh, majors and uh, st studies that people have, like engineering, where you basically have the next four years mapped out for you for classes. But if you mess up once, you're in, you're in dire trouble, right? You're, you're you behind. Yeah, you're behind. And it's a shame when people have to stay extra than that if they don't want to, because that's another you know, couple grand you're dropping. And it's a shame if you're that's dropping That's your life. Grand. Yeah, exactly. And if you're dropping that much with student loans and with just support from whatever, serv from whatever sources you have, just to take one thing, because you, you should have had the ability to, I think, is, is terrible. Terrible. And there's a lot of issues, I think, among students about issues of access to education and the quality of education right now just because of the impact right now. There's a big uh, issue that I tried to work on that happened last year where, um, do you take any AP courses right now or anything? Um, I took a lot of AP courses last year. Yeah. Did you, you only had, did you have IB classes too or anything? No. No? Okay. We only had AP. Well, AP's good, too. I took AP, too. Um, so when I came in, I had 40-ish units of AP, right? Mm -hmm. And that got me ahead in the line of registration. The, 
the academic senate felt that it was not fair, and I kind of see what their point is, right? It wasn't fair that people could jump the line because of access to AP, because not all schools because, have AP. Yeah, yeah that's right. true. So a lot not of all them schools don't have, have the yeah. amount. But you still put in a lot of money and a lot of hard work to do it, right? But mm -hmm. you now, if you go to UC Davis, you don't really gain anything except you're being pushed towards your unit cap faster, because it's not the only benefit for those AP classes left is that you are annulled from taking class. So if you took AP Psychology, I didn't take AP Psych. Which one did you take? Um, I took AP Complet, AP a, a lot of a lot of it, yeah. a lot of them. Um, lot of AP ones. Statistics, um, AP yeah. Physics. So if you took like AP Statistics, yes, then the low the lowest statistics class you were like basically saying you don't have to take it anymore, and that's it. Right. But there's a lot of things if you didn't go into major with English or something that didn't really matter to you, right? Yeah, I found yeah. that it didn't. Oh, no. <laughs> a lot of my AP classes didn't really count for much. Yeah. So. So they didn't count that much, right? So then um, when, so now with those loads, you just pushed. So some people who worked really hard in high school, you know, because they also had a fortunate background to be able to take AP or IB classes, are now you're just 80 units closer to your cap. And that's even worse because UC Davis kicks you out when you have that cap oh. limit now. So I tried to think outside the box and say, well, is there a fair way to still give credit to people and try to get time to degree? So I've been working with the Academic Senate to try to say, how about give them GE credit for that? Because GEs are the places, general education is where classes are impacted, and it's where people take electives. But it's like, if I hadn't had to do like an arts and humanities thing, I could graduate faster, or if I hadn't had to do, this is just one way of brainstorming this, right? But if people didn't have any conflict or felt unfair that, hey, that guy's ahead of me in line, because, but no one would care if all your classes were available. So, so if I was last in line and I still got all my classes because there was plenty of space, or reasonable space, right? And it could still take whatever I wanted. No one would be mad at each other for this. So a lot of these issues, I think, come from scarcity, right? And scarcity gets worse as there's more people demanding things. Same for housing, same for education. You know. Sorry, just to talk for a long time. No, that's what you're here for, brother, <laughs> you know? So I think we've talked about the chancellor enough. So <laughs> how can students be more engaged in city? Yeah. In, with the chancellor and with civics in general, you think? Answer your own no. question. I would, <laughs> I would say, especially with the chancellor search, we had a great out, um, showing in the last engagement efforts we had. So the first chancellor town hall we had, I think that was the s official week one of UC Davis. Um, we had you know, like 40, 50 people show up to that town hall, and it was still middle classes and everything. People came out and voiced their opinions about you know, this process isn't the most transparent, it doesn't engage the most students, and we're gonna try to fix that, right? And student leadership now is thinking about ways to do it. You know, it's a shame that we have to now, as students, on top of our course load and on top of everything else we have, also think about how to change an entire structure of system. That's, in the end, I guess, what we signed up to do. Uh, but also just, and then with the survey that got sent out, we had over 350 undergrads reply, and they all had very thoughtful response. Most of them had very thoughtful responses. Some of them were pretty long, too. Uh, about 100 to 200 grads also replied. So that's very proportional to our population, I think, in terms of engagement. But really, there needs to be more awareness, right? So I'm very happy to go on shows and talk to the media and stuff about all the issues that are happening, because I think a lot of times the media um, doesn't look at the student perspective enough. They'll go, because it's easy to say, this is Dr. blah, blah, blah. He's an expert in whatever, right? Or this is your administrator. And they can try to talk about it, and they can be a good source. But there's not enough attention to the student angle, I think. And one thing that really contributed to the downfall of Katehi was all that pressure from external, right? And if that didn't, wasn't there, I would seriously doubt that um, we would have the success we had. Because with, it was a real help, I think, with especially on Dirks, Chancellor of Berkeley, and on Katehi, when there's the LA Times and the SACB and everyone on state legislatures drawing fire on them, it really helps, right? Helps have an ally outside, yeah. right? You don't think the students would have been able to do it on their own? I, th I think that it would definitely have been much, much harder. Right without that kind of sustained attention, because it, it, it reciprocates, right? When you've got SAC media attention, students see that more, too. And mm -hmm. then they're like, OK, what are, what's happening, you know? Versus people who are literally sleeping during finals on the fifth floor of Iraq, posting on social media can only reach so far, right? But when you combine that with state legislatures saying something, combine that with uh, media attention, then you really get a combined awareness of it, right? And really more people are invested in this. And that's what the, I think is a shame right now with the Chancellor search is there's been less engagement now. <laughs> there's just been less, 
attention from SACB, from even local outsources. I mean, there's been every now and then the article, but I think we need to sustain that as students, right? And we need to keep the dialogue going because we don't, don't want it to be forgotten, right? And we are all busy as students, right? We, and I understand it's faculty too, but we need to find time to think about these things and really engage in it because if we let it slip on our radar, right, things can happen. And that's why we need that kind of attention to it. So I really wish it wasn't all about the Katehi drama that Sac he was interested in. I mean, I'm talking about Sac B a lot because they're a local regional yeah. newspaper, but it's to be fair about other papers and uh, publications too. But if they just focus more about systemic problem of chancellorships in general, I heard very, it wasn't until like Dirk Scott um, resigned. So Dirk is, was the chancellor yes. of Berkeley. Yes, he was the chancellor of Berkeley. Maybe Technically, still is. I'm not too sure. I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if he's resigned yet, but yes. I mean, effectively, he yeah, was. Yeah, he right? effectively, effectively is not. So he was the Chancellor of Berkeley, but until that happened to the Chancellor of Berkeley, they weren't even talking about this is a chancellery type problem. This was a Katehi only problem, which I think was a serious misstep because now a lot of the campus constituency students, undergrads, grads, and faculty are more concerned about the office of the chancellor and what those powers are and what the responsibility is rather than, oh, it's a Katehi drama, you know? Like, it was very important to highlight that kind of stuff and what not to do <clears throat> and also think about, like, what the role of the chancellor is. But that position is more important to us than the person, right? And I think that's what the media kind of misses because it's not drama in a sense, that way, right? It's but boring. It's, it's, bore, it's more boring, I would say. It's not as hot and gossipy, but it's still just as important, I think. And their stakes are just as high, I think, you know? When you replace one unfavorable person in power, you, it's, you know, we've seen this in history all the time, right? It's just as important what comes next. You know? So I want to thank you for being yeah. on our show. We didn't let Zoe talk very oh, much, I'm but sorry. she got to talk <laughs> whenever she wanted to, and she was the center of attention the whole mm -hmm. time. So thank you. So um, when I was a student and was 19, James Simon Kernan was one of the leaders of the student revolt at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called The Strawberry Statement. And in The Strawberry Statement, which I have a copy of, he said, don't trust anybody over 30. Well, he was 19 and I was 19. I'm 68. That means if he's still alive, he's 68. And I <laughs> hope he trusts himself. So. Us baby boomers have learned a lot, but we're still in the same crisis as we were in in the 60s. So the same challenges that we had, you have in terms of communicating with the administration. Um, next week, our guest is going to be Ralph Hexter. He is now the interim chancellor at UC Davis. He's in the middle of this election process. We're going to give him a chance to tell his story. This is what's going on. Thanks for being with us. Good evening.